welcome. I'm very delighted to introduce you to the authors of our next panel, Susana Moreira Marques, who is joining us from Portugal. She's a journalist uh, and uh, author whose uh, book that we'll be discussing today, now and at the hour of our death, has recently made its way into French. And also with us today is Jorge Comensal, who joins us from Mexico. He's currently also a fellow of uh, the foundation, and we'll be discussing his debut novel, The Mutations, which has recently appeared in both English and in French. And given that the topic of this year's festival concerns change, I thought that maybe we could begin with a question about that. For those in the audience who are unfamiliar with the two books, just a little bit of framing, uh, so you'll understand the, the toggling between the two of them. Um, that now and the hour of our death is, uh, well, a book of, let's say, creative nonfiction. This seems based on reportage uh, concerning a small community uh, in northeastern Portugal uh, within which there exist people who require palliative care uh, before they die. And so you're, very, you're a presence in these books as you witness the, the deaths of these individuals and the, and, and the way that the people around them respond. Um, and, uh, and whereas Comensal has written a novel, uh, this doesn't sound very funny, but, but we'll get into this topic because it's quite interesting, right? Uh, who, about a cultivated uh, acerbic uh, and, uh, and entertaining uh, lawyer uh, in Mexico who uh, very early on discovers that he has uh, lung cancer, um, and the book chronicles his decline and death. And it's a very, very funny book. But we'll get into those topics. And of course, the, the topic today is uh, of this particular panel is about uh, death and disease, uh, a, a hilarious uh, subject. So, um, but on the notion of change, I thought we might begin, if maybe the two of you could tell me individually about your own work, since both of them, one thing that they have in common is they chronicle through the passage of time, right, the effects of individuals who are in decline, <laughs> and, and it's a one-way road. Uh, and so it, they, both, they both deal with the person dying, and they also deal with the environment around those individuals. And I wonder, maybe you could say something about the importance of time or the relation to change that you felt as you were trying to capture that in, in your books. Um, first of all, Danielle, <laughs> thank you uh, for being the moderator. Thank you, Jorge, uh, for being here with me. It's a, a real pleasure to be here at the Foundation uh, and to be doing this event with the two of you. Um, it's true that time was, uh, was very important for me when I started to work. Uh, I, I initially uh, went to this area of Portugal called Traz os Montes, literally means uh, behind the hills, and it's, uh, it's probably the furthest you can uh, uh, go uh, from Lisbon without, without leaving the country. And uh, uh, when I arrived, I was uh, first following a palliative care health team, and um, and immediately I understood that I could not just be there. Even if I would stay there for a month, it would not be enough because I would have to come back and see how people were living through, uh, through the experience that they were um, uh, going through. Uh, these were people who live in villages uh, in this area of Portugal. Some of them were old, but others weren't that old actually. They, they were quite young. Uh, and, um, and they had very different uh, uh, illnesses. Um, but I wanted to follow, it was not the fo follow, following the illness itself, but following how people would die with their own, with their own um, illness first, and also how the family would, would deal with, with, uh, with what they were uh, living. And, uh, uh, and of course for that I had to come back. Um, and I had to come back in some cases when I came back, 
to that uh, to, to to that area, uh, some of the people I had met initially already were dead. So then I could also see how people were living through their grief. Um, so um, so I did that. I, I realized that I needed that time to be able to have a more uh, profound view of uh, of what it is to to be at the end of one's life. And uh, so I did that. Uh, and uh, I ended up going um, in s different seasons. And this is a rural area, it's very beautiful. And it's also a place uh, in Portugal that has lost a lot of uh, population. Um, so it's very depopulated. And so it tends to be very empty. And, uh, uh, and also I ended up realizing I was also kind of witnessing uh, the dying of a place and uh, the dying of a certain way of life Which is to say that was very have connected. All left. There are very yeah. few young people. Yeah, right. there are very few young people. The old people are dying, and with them, there's also a way of living that is dying. It's not only them; it's that generation, uh, and and uh, of course, things changed so much in Portugal in the last few decades. It really is, uh, Portugal had a dictatorship until the 70s, and so um, it is, it, it's a completely different world from what it was in the 70s. Uh, and so it, this to also talk about the, the, the subject of change, um, the, the country did change for the better, but uh, obviously a lot of uh, ways of life uh, have disappeared and I realized that I was interested in also capturing a little bit of that, though that was not the focus of the book. But just to finish, uh, the most important thing about change for me in this book was, um, was not in the, in the people who were ill, uh, but it was in their families, the people around them, that I could see that they became different as they were taking care of their loved ones they started to see things differently. Uh, it was not so much over time, but mm, pretty much quickly. As soon as they had someone who, who, who was sick and they had to take care of that person, they started to see the world differently. They started to value different things. And when I was talking to people, they were constantly telling me, uh, you know, you have to make the most of life. You have to make the most of you know, the time you still have with your father or with your mother and uh, just, just enjoy life, just be happy. Uh, and it sounds uh, a lot like a cliche, and it is, but it's true that most of the time we, we don't think like this. We know we're gonna die, but we don't, uh, we don't really um, grasp it. And we spend a lot of time just uh, with things that are not important, right? That's our day to day, it's uh, basically mostly done with uh, uh, details that are not important. And finally, when I wrote the book, I wanted the, the reader to go through a transformation. And that's why I built it as it is, because I wanted uh, for the reader to do the same path that I had done to write the book. So there's a travel, and I went there, I traveled there, I saw, I saw that landscape I was confronted with, with illness, pain, uh, uh, death, and it was quite hard. Then I started to meet people, talking to them, getting a bit deeper into their lives and also witnessing how brave uh, they were and how happy sometimes they could be also in those last moments. And, uh, and that gave me hope. And I, I felt transformed by the experience and I wanted the reader to sort of go through that kind of road with me and at the end be a little bit transformed. I guess every writer was, wants that to happen, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, I, I'm eager to change and that is why I'm very happy about this topic of, of uh, Bibliotopia because, well, uh, because of the novel, The Mutations, I have had the chance to discuss uh, death and mortality and disease for almost six years now. <laughs> Uh, so, and thanks to the Fondación Jan Michalski, I probably will finish another novel and uh, so change to lighter subjects like, uh, well, uh, addiction, mass extinction of animals. <laughs> but uh, So, yes, I, I, I have the need to change now. 
And uh, sometimes uh, uh, tragedies like cancer can bring about positive changes also. Uh, but in this novel, I, I wanted to explore uh, the concept of uh, mutation you know, that we have heard about so much uh, in this <laughs> pandemic because uh, mutation in the cells, in our genes, is a kind of change that you can't predict and you can never understand and you cannot, you don't know where it comes from because it comes from, from the void randomness and uh, you don't know where it's going to lead you and where it's going to lead life because mutation is responsible for evolution, thanks to which we are here now, and it's also responsible to, uh, of uh, very hard experiences, very painful experiences, like the ones uh, Susanna um, includes in, in her book, and the, the ones that my characters have to live through. So um, I have always been trying to to find a way to deal with the anxiety of not knowing when change is going to come. And that is why uh, maybe the, the book ended uh, up being a little bit uh, funny or humorous because uh, I wanted to find something uh, of light in the midst of that uh, darkness that we usually can't speak about. Uh, because we are, I think, very afraid uh, to, with reason, of course, to speak about cancer, not only because uh, it is so common, but also because there is uh, moral attachments to the sickness that uh, I also explore in the novel. So That's quite interesting. Is, and in some respects, I think Susanna has already answered this follow-up question that I posed, but I was thinking about, while well, preparing the questions, uh, the, the end of, of Kafka's metamorphosis, which is in German, Verwandlung, which means transformation, yes. right? And uh, for those who don't recall, it's mostly about this, okay, there's Gregor Zamsa and there's the insect, but the final scene in the story is his sister standing up in the tram and raising her, you know, stretching. And, and it's clear that she is, you know, she's going to be a mother soon, that, that she is moving on, that, that, you know, she herself has also a being transformed. And I was thinking, certainly in your fiction, it's not just about what happens to your protagonist, right? It's a lot of what the dynamic of is what's going on the, within the family, within the immediate environment, and the people who undergo this. I think this is similar in, in, in your book as well. You see this, um, that it's not just as though, uh, of course, everybody um, carries his or her own death, and that's, you know, you're, you're, that, that, that's self-enclosed but those around that individual are transformed by that process as well. Um, yeah, and I was very interested in the phenomenon of change of scale of change. Now, do you know a, a change, a microscopic change in the genes of one cell, uh, be, it starts changing of scale, first it changes the tissue, the, then the whole organism, then the family, then society, uh, then history. Uh, so, um, and I think also changing the perspective going from one scale to another can help us deal with th th these kind of changes and to see it from afar and see it from very close with a mi microscope or with a telescope that science provide and that sometimes also this uh, uh, tragicomic distance of the narrator can also offer in order to make it more bearable uh, to deal with change. I think this is something that also applies to, to both of you, um, because anything about change or transformation necessarily involves time. Um, and since, you know, uh, these are both books, time needs to be narrated. So the mutations has a very um, deft way of moving forward through several different events in which individuals are utterly transformed, and it happens over the course of, you know, a paragraph um, that months have elapsed and all of the changes that are consequential to physical changes, right, um, are somehow beautifully developed um, in terms of transitions. You mentioned the change of the seasons and trying to capture different before and after moments between the different individuals. Can, could you both say something about, like, um, this is a shop talk question, about, you know, writing or finding ways of narrating 
time and the, the particular challenges they posed or your approach or your thoughts about it while, while constructing these narratives? <laughs> well, uh, I, I sought a challenge um, to narrate this history of a mutation in one of the chapters and the challenge was to uh, include more than 2,000 years of history in a few pages. And uh, I realized while well, trying to tell the story of this, that we can tell thanks to uh, gene, uh, science and genomes, how the, these genes uh, travel from one part of the world to another one, uh, from Palestine to Mexico, uh, and the, the whole history was there. I couldn't do it without uh, characters. I had to jump between lives. So I had to zoom in and zoom out. Uh, but I, I, because if I try to, of course, to talk about all those uh, centuries, it would have taken me a whole book. So I had to choose. I have 3,000 years of history before me, and I have to choose four characters, secondary characters, that will appear for two or three paragraphs. And uh, there was a sorcerer and a shepherd, and you know, and I had to create them to be able to include in this kind of uh, fiction the the illusion of history. No. Um, well, uh, I must say that the way I, I wrote, uh, if the, the book isn't written in a, a conventional r reporting way at all but uh, the writing is very much connected with the field work. And I always uh, felt as I was writing that it was the material that was giving me the writing, uh, if I can say so. Um, the, the first part of the book, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's my travels through these, uh, through these uh, villages. And, uh, and I think that the time, the time of the writing is that, it's the time of the travel. But it's almost as if I was um, catching people in one moment of their lives. And uh, so some of the, the things I write about um, are little, almost little stories uh, of people that I met during those travels. And sometimes it's just a paragraph. And in that paragraph, I tell the story of that person uh, and what she's doing now. And it's almost as if you can catch a glimpse of that life, and then you move forward a bit, and then you catch another glimpse of another life. Uh, but it's almost as if I could not know more about them than just what I have seen there, um, which is what the um, novelist does, right? He creates the, the life of that person, but as a nonfiction writer, I cannot create, I cannot invent that life, but I think that, um, that can be also uh, something that uh, can be very powerful because you don't know that life. You can only know that, but you know, that is that slice of life. Um, uh, it was interesting because yesterday when I was uh, listening to Adania in your ses sessions, she was talking about the silences. And um, in my book, I, you know, I had a lot of material. I, I, I spent a lot of time in this place. I interviewed a lot of people, and I could have written a much longer book. Um, and it always felt like it had to be short. Maybe just because I'm a bit lazy too, but <laughs> that can be one of the reasons. Uh, but I always felt that it had to be, it had to be short, and that um, somehow there had to be a lot of silences in there, a lot of breathing space for the reader. And we're talking about something that is uh, so universal, so common to all of us. We will all, uh, and I'm not talking about dying because we're all going to die, of course, but I, I mean taking care of the dying. That, 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 is, that is something that we will all go through if we haven't already, right? And, uh, and so I felt that uh, I didn't need to say much in many uh, instances because the reader knows, the reader has, has lived this and, uh, or is going to live and, and uh, it's, uh, there's, um, there's that space for the reader and I always wanted to, to have that. And then of course the second part of the book, it tells the stories in more depth of three, uh, three stories, three cases. And um, 
And what was interesting uh, in to, for me to do that is that when I started meeting these people and talking to them, I realized that I could not just talk about their deaths without talking about their lives. I mean, that would be just uh, horrible. And, uh, and then I realized they had really interesting lives. And that's also what is so beautiful also about being a journalist or being a writer who does field work is that you go out there and you start talking to people and it's just amazing the adventures that they have to tell. And some of those adventures also captured a lot about the history of Portugal, uh, the history of the 20th century. Um, and so it was really interesting. So I did this uh, very in-depth uh, interviews with these people. And I, and I told their story. So they tell their story uh, from when they were very young until the moment that they are living now. So it's a different, completely different time uh, that appears in the book from, from the rest of the book when, when these people are telling their stories from when they, you know, when they're going back to the 50s or the 70s. Or I wonder whether you have any thoughts about ritual and response. Um, for example, I mean, obviously th there are, you know, there's a, there's a Catholic response to death. Uh, there are certain practices. There are objects, the place of religion in these locations and secularism. Your, your protagonist is uh, an atheist. Uh, uh, one might even say an orthodox atheist, right? <laughs> um, a radical atheist. Uh, so so um, these are both, it's, 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 I was interested in the, it, those aspects because of belief and, and the way that people around them uh, respond, right? Uh, whether something is programmed and you simply follow in the motions of it or what happens when, when yeah, these are isolated sit towns and perhaps the kind of framework that used to exist, a full church and so on, is, has weakened. Uh, so much that you only have the traces left. Yeah, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I found myself writing a lot about God. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and addressing God, and, uh, and I'm, I'm an atheist, and um, I didn't have a religious uh, education. Um, in this area of Portugal, people are very religious, and the older people tend to be even more religious. And of course, the distance that I have, I, I mean, that's also very interesting for us to discuss uh, in, in our current world, the distance that I have uh, to these people in Transmont is probably greater than uh, from someone my age living in Geneva or in Paris or in London, you know? Um, uh, although, of course, they are my people and it's uh, which, which, uh, which makes you uh, work and write with a greater tender, tenderness, I guess. Uh, but they're very different from, from me in the sense that they, yeah, still um, have a system of beliefs and uh, that is completely different from what is my life in Lisbon. So this is, these are very religious people. And of course, uh, there's another aspect, which is not religion. So they are religious because that's how they grew up, that's what they know. There's always a church. These villages don't have anything. Sometimes they don't have a post office or you know, a supermarket, anything, but there's a church and there's a priest who comes like once a week at least. Okay, so there's, there's mass, so <laughs> it's something that, it, that is really important. And of course, I think um, it consoles people, it, it helps them um, to, to believe. Uh, but it's funny because one of the uh, elderly people I, I uh, talked with and that made it to the to be one of the main characters of the book, uh, Senor João, um, he, he says at a certain point, you know, they told us this story that we're all gonna rise from the death, and, but how do we know, you know, nobody, nobody tells us, you know, the death don't, the death don't, don't come back to tell us. So he, he, he believes, but you know, he has his doubts. Uh, I think that actually what was interesting for me to discover was how much uh, uh, people, um, who were, uh, you know, these are people who, who live in the countryside and often works, work the land. And they were, they made a lot of parallels with the cycle of life in general, you know. Uh, so these are people who watch their animals die. 
um, they they go through the, every year through the cycle of, of um, you know uh, of their trees and giving fruit and uh, you know do you have to do the whole, uh, you see you see the cycle of life constantly and I think uh, those people that they're very simple they they have that sort of a wisdom to say you know it's the cycle of life and it helped them I think they feel so connected with the land and mm -hmm. and nature and they kind of feel a part of that and I think that also it's it's not religion but it, it does bring consolation that feeling that we are part of something greater and I think we we kind of lose that a bit in the cities I think in, in the mutations most of the characters are very religious and especially the oncologist the oh, okay. yeah, uh, <laughs> in, a, in another sort of way he I was I, I am fascinated by the psychological experience of a physician who has to uh, deal with this kind of um, uh, disease and uh, he was raised uh, as a very orthodox Catholic but then he distanced absolutely from religion uh, in that sense and he found religion somewhere else and it's in music no? so the way he listens to music and uh, how that gives purpose and finds beauty and it is uh, particularly Bach's, Bach's uh, Johann Sebastian Bach's music uh, through that experience uh, he can remain connected to the transcendent and also uh, for example Ramon I think the, the main character this atheist who is a lawyer a very uh, um, belligerent one he finds a way of praying I think in this period through the, his conversations with a, a parrot you know a parrot with whom he cannot speak and in that sense I was trying to pay homage to Flaubert's uh, Ancoc Sample uh, so, and that is prayer for him in these uh, difficult hours um, so yes I think in a, every character I try to to explore their their spiritual dimension, even though they were very scientific or very uh, anti-Catholic. Yeah, it's, this is a good opportunity to bring up the funny part about disease and death. Um, partly because I feel like, especially in your novel, um, where you know when I described it in the beginning to those of you who have not read it before, yeah, it's the story of a man who discovers that he, who, who has previously been eloquent, uh, loves to speak, is, is, is gifted at it. Um, and from the very beginning of the novel, you know, he, he finds out that he has cancer, it's a rare form, they're going to have to remove the tongue, that happens, and, uh, and it's all downhill from there. Um, but you wouldn't actually think that this is a terrifically fun novel to read. Um, and not just because, although that helps too, that there's a parrot named after Benito Juarez, uh, who, who curses and then says obscene things all the time um, in the book. Uh, I, I've been thinking about this recently because, I mean, we're so, we've been so uh, saturated by um, if, if the presence of death in the past year uh, the, about different kinds of defenses uh, and responses. And one of them is, well, maybe it's one and the same, irony and humor. Um, which has such a strong presence in your novel. Um, it seems to be a, a kind of, a, a, whether it's out of chutzpah or out of you know, uh, resistance or out of simply pride and arrogance, you know, this way of simply not succumbing, of, yes. of, 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 of looking the thing in the eye, not denying it, you have no choice. <laughs> you know, you're, there's nothing to be done, um, but, but making a joke at the same time. Uh, there's, there's something I find dignified in that. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I suppose that's not something that you can plan, but, but it's, 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 it's extraordinary that a book that has this kind of emphasis in which they, and I should say that's not the, when you mentioned uh, there's a parrot in the book and it's a tribute to the parrot, you know, that Felicité, the maid in, in, yes. in A Simple Heart uh, purchases, it's not the only thing that you have in common with Flaubert. I think there, there's several uh, that, that, that may, we may discuss a little bit later, but you know, it's pretty pitiless the way that you actually represent the social milieus, the individuals, their environments, the way that they work, and yet it's a really funny book. Um. <laughs> well, well, this uh, uh, allows me to, 
to mention something else about change, which is really difficult, and I think in your book too, the, the how to translate language, for example, how to translate cursing between languages is very hard to, to uh, there's a lot of uh, content lost in translation when you are using this uh, obscene language uh, in, uh, that the parrot uses and uh, that allows the characters to uh, um, liberate some of the tension and of the absurdity of what we have to live through sometimes and especially with uh, this disease. And yes, I, I was trying to, to dissect the language and all those subtleties of, uh, for example, social class in Mexico that are revealed through language, through the kind of course words that you use, that a parrot would use and a human would use. Um, and it's been interesting to see how that uh, has to change and to transform uh, through translation. And I just wanted to mention that. And I, I thought about that when I read Susanna's book that uh, gives life, gives voice to the, the characters from this region of Portugal um, about what was being, um, how the special way of uh, speaking Portuguese in that region was um, survived translation. No? I, well, also, when, when we think of translation and obscenity, I mean, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Mexico has a very special and particular form of obscenity. I hadn't even thought of this, of course, because I'm reading it in English, right? Yeah. Um, but I, I, I suppose that the parrot is obscene in Mexican Spanish. Um, I, I know somebody who recently, uh, you know, several people into different languages translated uh, Fernanda Melchor's uh, hurricane yes. season. Uh, and I... I from what I've understood, one of the great challenges is, you know, finding ways to render Mexican obscenity. <laughs> finding inventive ways to, to, to actually convey that in German, in English, in French, and, you know, uh, and in each case, uh, I think the translators have had, you know, <laughs> their own challenges. That's so. true. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, this is maybe there's a great transition here because um, we talked a little bit about social milieu, and I think that there's there's a Flaubertian take that you have on uh, the middle class, uh, not just the middle class, and there are different social strata in the novel, um, and maybe you can, and, and this definitely seems to me a concern um, in in your book, Susanna, even if it's just it's the nature of of, of the environment and the setting of the book, um, but the question of class. Um, and and the role that it has in the lives that people lead and the way that they think. Um, it's, it's distinct as a reader. I became aware of it in different ways uh, while reading each of your books. Yeah, um, yeah no, for, for sure. I think, um, uh, of course, I was meeting the people that were there and were sick, so... Um, uh, and, and, and of course the people who have more money and are from different classes probably would not be there or would be taken care of privately. So I, I'm not sure, it's, it was not like I chose uh, just to, to, uh, to look at people from a certain class. So it was a bit what I found. But uh, if I wasn't interested in, uh, in that, I probably would not have written so much about the people's lives, those people's lives. And, uh, and my work has, uh, has been a lot about uh, telling stories that are usually untold, and the reason they are untold is because the people are uh, too poor or uh, just not relevant enough in society to have a voice to tell them, to tell the, the, their own stories. Um, actually, we, we joked yesterday night when we met uh, about our uh, backgrounds uh, uh, and about the fact that you said that you don't know much about your name because you, know, you don't have uh, history records from your family, and uh, me neither. Uh, I know very little about my family as well because um, both my grandparents on, on both sides of my family were people from the countryside uh, and educated. I mean, they, they learned not to read and write, but not much more than that. And, uh, and, and so there, there is no family records. There is no family archives. There is no 
homes to inherit with uh, you know there old are furniture that, that comes and and and, yeah. and, uh, and and paintings and uh, whatever that I, I I do have at home uh, a painting uh, which is um, from um, uh, belongs to my partner and he does have the history of his family and we have at home a painting like very solemn big painting of one of his ancestors and uh, he brought it from his uh, father's house uh, when, his, when he, his father passed away uh, and so I never had that and um, there's, there's a moment in the book where, where, I, where I write this and I often tell it as well uh, there was some once I was in, in conversation with my grandfather um, he, he did say something like you know uh, who would care about my story? Uh, you know, the, the, only the rich are entitled to to have history, and that's always been a preoccupation of mine. And I, I think, uh, probably, I write uh, for things not to disappear as a way to keep them, just to keep the stories, to keep the records, to to keep it alive. I think that's my main. Um, the thing that keeps me that keeps me going, and uh, and very recently, I decided to write obituaries uh, of people who died with COVID-19. I never expected to write about dying people anymore because it was really for a while. Like Jorge was saying, that he's invited to talk about cancer for six years. I wrote this book ten years ago, and I've been invited to talk about dying I mean many <laughs> times it's like and every time there's a discussion about how oh, dying it's like who's gonna we're gonna call Susanna uh, and um, and so I was tired and I didn't want to go into the subject anymore I, I, I did another book after was was about motherhood so you know very different and also in the cycle of life <laughs> and uh, but then when the when the pandemic started um, I wasn't really working as a journalist. I mean, there were moments in my life where I was working for a newspaper regularly. This was not the case. I wasn't. Uh, I was writing other things and doing other things. And then I was just so shocked with the fact that people were dying and we were not talk talking uh, about them. And, you know, if there's a plane crash, for example, everybody knows the stories of the people who died in the plane crash. I mean, all the details, right? Where they came from, were they married, did they leave kids? And uh, uh, in Portugal, we had very big f uh, fires like two or three years ago. And, you know, we, we learned the stories of, of these people. And, uh, uh, and I, I know that uh, cultures are also different. And, for example, the New York Times had this uh, ongoing uh, obituary um, series that was beautiful yeah. in which they uh, uh, had stories of famous people who had died, but also common people. Uh, but that was not the case in Portugal. There was this silence over over, over COVID-19 uh, deaths, and I uh, so I decided to start telling uh, stories of some of these people um, and common people. And once again, it was really such a privilege to be able to talk with the, the families of these of these people. They were so um, at first, uh, often at first they were they were a bit afraid in the newspaper and all that, but then they are so happy to be able to tell something about their loved one and to see it somehow recorded. And again, those stories were beautiful, and again, those stories were telling the history of my country and probably of um, a part of Europe, you know. We're talking about um, people who had memories of Second World War, of course, but also in Portugal, a lot of men who had... Um, fought in the colonial wars in the 60s and the 70s, which was a long war, and so there were several generations of men who, who fought uh, in Africa. And, uh, and so all, all, all th these people really went through um, a century that was so filled with events that completely transformed, again, the word, um, common people's lives. I mean, you know, that brush with history that uh, every single life story as is really beautiful and it interests me a lot. Uh, ancestry, it's frequently used to divide people, to create identities, uh, frontiers between people, you know, if you descend from someone or from some group. But I think that uh, this kind of 
memory, if we change the scale of ancestry, it can unite us and uh, help us to remember through genetics, through uh, um, anthropology, uh, that we all come from the same origins, that we be belong to the same species, that, that there is a common uh, story to be told between different peoples. And that's what I try to do in that um, passage of the novel that I mentioned uh, through 3,000 years. And we can do it even uh, farther from here, like uh, there's this popular name of the mitochondrial Eva, you know, the, the small group of women from which we all descend and uh, that we all humans share the same uh, genes in our mitochondria. And we can, I believe, uh, tell new narratives, new stories through the knowledge that is in the scientific journals, which is very hard to read, but uh, which tells another story uh, in another scale and allows us to understand that many of those differences that we find through identity politics and all that are really not transcendental, not deep. deep. If we go deeper, we are all uh, uh, bonded by that. Yeah. I want to ask a question about history. Um, again, these are two very different kinds of books and they have a different focus, but for example, while reading your book, Suzanne, I mentioned last night that I was struck by um, the presence of colonial history. It's not a book about colonialism and it's not a book about Portugal's past. It's a book about these individuals and their life stories. But if you come to it from a distance and you're sensitive to it, you see, aha, uh -huh, Macau, and these people have spent time in Angola. And, and you know, these, these aspects of history are not just uh, these distant, you know, fragments in a book. Uh, or origins, but their actual experiences within the families. They manifest in certain way in the same way that, you know, for uh, my in-laws and friends and their families in France, you have this person who's born in Bamako and this person who spent time working in Hanoi, and it's very matter of fact, but it's, so how did they end up there? Well, it's obviously it's connected to what is happening in 1920, 1930, 1950, etc. And uh, yeah, I'm curious as to your thinking about both, again, in these different works, your consciousness of those historical aspects that, that you may be narrating. Um, is it something that maybe you read the work when it's finished and you notice patterns? Or are there certain cases where, actually, in your a friend of mine told me, I think, and forgive me if I'm misquoting, he said that you wanted to write the great Mexican book about death, but, or something <laughs> like that, but, but uh, I wonder, even if you're thinking about that, there's something that's, once you're thinking about nation, right, you're, oh, you're, it's, it's, it's yeah. got to be somehow framed within a historical context. Yeah, yeah and with the stereotype of the way that Mexico and Mexicans deal with death, I think uh, I, I also wanted to respond to that stereotype with another perspective. And, um, well, the, you mentioned the, the name of the parrot belongs to a, a president <laughs> in the 19th century, which was a very important point uh, in Mexican history because he was the first indigenous president. Uh, but at the same time, he, his, uh, the politics that he uh, implemented were very uh, affected the indigenous people. And, uh, there, it was a moment, I think, that Mexico's history could have gone down another path, a completely other path. And uh, the, this lawyer talks about it, and it has to do with, uh, with law, with the uh, um, use of law to manipulate and to control certain parts of the population. So I don't want to go into detail about Mexico's history, but it is there to uh, remind us that there are differences that among people in Mexico that could have been um, overcome and that aren't. And in fact, for example, between the family of uh, this character and uh, his wife, there is uh, a, a friction that no one can speak about. And there are a lot of things that no one can touch. Uh, and silence is also important in that sense uh, because of our history that we are not talking about, for example, the fact that our first indigenous president uh, really affected indigenous peoples in a terrible way. You know, 
So it, uh, that is a conflict which uh, th this lawyer th thinks about a lot. It's interesting what you're saying about uh, how Mexicans uh, perceive death or how we perceive that Mexicans perceive death. Uh, one of my, you know, my daughter's one of one of her favorite uh, films is uh, Coco, 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 which is uh, beautiful. Uh, I don't know if you saw it, but it's about uh, it, it, it. It gives you a certain way of looking at death that it helps, uh, especially with kids when they start to realize what what is death and start to have all these questions. But it's interesting because it does change a lot. And just before I was saying this is so universal, and it is, but it changes so much. I remember because, you know, of course the book came out a long time ago and I, I already spoke about it uh, often in many different places. One of the places I went to was uh, Bali. I went to a festival in Bali and when I got there, it's like one of the first events you know, there was someone that approached me after and said, you know, this doesn't make any sense here. It's like, your book doesn't make any sense. <laughs> because, um, because uh, we, you know, the whole thing about um, facing our hands and, and seeing what we can, we can also bring to our lives when, when we do that. No, that, that, that's the whole point, is that you face death not to just, just not because of, or, or to be um, depressed, but so you can live better, right? And at the end, it's 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 a little bit about that. It's it's to accept it, to make it a part of our lives, and eventually even live better. And 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 um, and to make it a part of our lives is something that is not true of uh, Western culture. And, and there was when my book came out, there was still the big taboo about talking about uh, death and dying. And I think it changed a little bit because there was a lot of discussion uh, in Portugal in the last few years about uh, how to die, how we die, about euthanasia and all that, and it changed a bit. But when the book came out 10 years ago, no, not 10 years ago, but yeah, nine, whatever, eight, nine years ago, uh, I, I, I felt at the time that it was still pretty much um, a taboo. Um, yeah. Regarding history, <laughs> um, it's what I was saying before, you know, our history is so rich. I mean, I, I guess everybody's history is so rich and there is so much to tell. And I remember when I was writing the stories of the people, so there are parts of the book that are um, in the voice of those people. So what I did is that I worked from interviews and I edited, but I did not put my words. It's, it's in their words, it's heavily edited and sometimes it's more than one interview done in different times, but then I put together as if it's just a monologue, or in one case, there's a couple, it's a dialogue, but it's their voice, their words. Um, so, so I did that, and when I was, when I started, I hadn't planned to write, I hadn't planned any of this, of course, as, you, <laughs> as it happens. When I went back home and started to write, uh, I hadn't planned at all uh, to have, um, you know, transcripts of the interviews um, or anything like that. But when I started to uh, listen to the interviews and actually just transcribe them, I realized it was so, so, so rich. And, and, and it occurred to me, I mean, there are novelists who like work for years to be able to come up with something like this, right? Uh, in terms of voice, in terms of character, in terms of the story. And it was just there offering itself to me. And uh, it, it was wonderful. And I feel that often when I go out and uh, speak with people and look for their stories. I really feel it's like, it's a treasure. It's like amazing. I just found one more diamond, you know. It's like amazing stories. And the truth is, uh, Portugal has an interesting history, as you were saying about France. We, I mean, we had colonies until uh, 75. Um, I think we were the last European country to, 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 to keep colonies. It's a particular history and it's still uh, of living memory. And I think that's what's also um, very important and it's important to me as a journalist or, or as someone who works from real people's stories uh, that this is living memory. And um, my parents, they um, both grew up in Angola and uh, in the colonial time. And uh, it's interesting because I visited Angola once 
and of course it was not their country, it couldn't be, but it's also because their country is a time, it's something that fortunately disappeared. Uh, but you find this in Portugal often, and, uh, and of course that uh, I, I, everyone's story, every, every person has an interesting life, I believe. If you have the time to listen to them, you will find really amazing stories and, uh, and, and ideas even, right? Uh, but of course I chose the main stories a little bit according to my sensibility and what interested me more. And obviously that story of the couple who has been in Angola is very similar to my grandparents. And so it, it meant something to me. It's funny because you speak about character and there are also individuals or anecdotes that seem to have made their way into the book that a fiction writer would want to poach or steal. I was thinking about the, uh, there's, I think it was, it's, is it like an eight-year-old woman whose husband is dying and she, wants, she just keeps wanting to sleep with him and at some point, as a result, he falls out of the bed and gets hospitalized. And it's like, I couldn't invent that, right? Uh, but, yes. but this is part of the documentation that makes its way into the book. Um, we have about 10 minutes uh, for, for questions. For those of you who are watching from afar, uh, there is a WhatsApp number as well as an email address. Uh, if you would like to uh, type in your question right now, somebody will bring over a uh, device in a moment. Uh, but in the meantime, if there's perhaps somebody in the audience here who's present uh, who has a question for Susana or Jorge. And of course, I have another question. I'm just afraid that if I ask it, we'll lose the time for anybody else. Yeah. So um, just wait a moment. Okay, so, yeah. Sorry, first of all, I have to say what a privilege it is to listen to all of you, and you're a beautiful moderator as well. Um, I wondered if you had ever, what your connection with one another was. I could hear a lot of appreciation for one another's books as you were speaking. So I just wondered if you had met prior to this or how you learned about one another's work before coming here and having the chance to get to know each other a little bit more, if that makes sense. Well, the connection is the Actually, foundation. Generation. We've just met. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. But we had an instant friendship. Uh, we've just met. We are both residents here at the foundation. Uh, Jorge has been here for a while. I arrived. Uh, he was very welcoming. We discovered that we have some friends in common, actually. Uh, and, uh, and then we discovered that our books had uh, you know, similar issues. And... Uh, and I loved that, and, I, and then we just uh, gave each other our books, and we've just read them. And I, I finished this book yesterday, and I loved it. <laughs> yeah, the, me too. You know, actually, your book made me think a lot about Tolstoy, the um, the death of Ivan Illich, yes. which is mm, one of the few books I quote in in my book. That's true. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and I, I took that book when I went to, to Trasremont on my first trip and I had it on my bedside. And I thought, you know, because it's, it's a classic and it's this thing about what does a man think while he's dying, right? And, uh, and he kind of sees his life uh, and he sort of questions how he lived, of course. And, um, uh, and, I, I, and I had this completely, I don't know, naive idea that I would be able to, in real life, understand how someone who is uh, ill and, and, and dying, what, you know, what goes through that person's mind. And, and of course, that was completely naive because most, most of the time people are not well enough uh, to talk to you about that. And, uh, and then they don't want to talk to you about, <laughs> about that. Uh, and I don't know if we do have such profound thoughts uh, as such. And I was reading that, so in a way that was always incomplete and it's interesting to think about that because that would have to be a fiction 
And, uh, and so as I was saying before, I think you're always, when you're writing nonfiction, you're always writing within certain limits, but then the limits become, become the literature, become the, uh, the thing itself, the object itself. But I did think a lot about Tolstoy and I thought, this is amazing, but with, yes, but more fun. <laughs> I absolutely agree with, with what you said about, um, we don't, sometimes you interview someone and he's not thinking about uh, death. And I think it, that's, that's very good. We are thinking about life, no? uh, like uh, right, death right gives you the, the chance yeah. to think about life and um, what, what you are leaving behind and we, what you have done. So we should all be thinking about life all the time, right to the end. Uh, and that's what my character does. Uh, and I also felt that with the boy, the ones you've given voice to in this book. I have a question for both uh, writers. What, um, <coughs> sorry, um, how did the writing of both of your books, since one is uh, more of a testimony and one's an invention work, uh, how has it changed your own relationship to to the concept of death as as of course a concept and an eventuality um, well the first thing that comes to mind is that it changed my conception of contagious diseases especially <laughs> because there is also a, a character who uh, because he lived through um, leukemia when he was a, a child uh, like this experience uh, left him with a great fear of contagion, of uh, a phobia of uh, disease. And uh, through this character, I think I was able to transform my own relationship with that and allowed me to live this on certain times with less anxiety because I, I had deposited all of that in, the, in that character who was very well prepared for this pandemic because he already used masks in public spaces, <laughs> he already used this uh, alcohol with all the time and he was furious that the rest of the society didn't do it. So I think he, at this moment of history in the fictional universe, he's so, uh, uh, like I told you so, he's, he's convinced that yes, he's so self-assured because he was right, he was prepared for the pandemic and we weren't, but he helped me prepare also. <laughs> I think uh, it's a difficult one. A lot of people ask me um, when I when I first published the book. A lot of people ask me, "Well, how, how could you do this? How could you go and spend like weeks with uh, people that were sick? And uh, how could you do this? Uh, wasn't very hard for you? How could you spend I don't know how many time writing months?" Uh, uh, and actually, no, it was one of the most um, um, positive and actually um, happy is not the word, but uh, joyful. It was one of the most joyful experiences that I had in my life and it, it really, it really, um, um, I, I'm not sure if it changed me as a person, I'm sure it didn't. But, uh, but it was really important for me. Uh, and at least for some time, it really made me appreciate life more. And it did help. Uh, I think that the best thing to deal with death and disease as well, it's not only that, it's the illness. It's to actually face it. And I think it, you're, you're much more afraid of the unknown than something that you actually um, you, you, you see. And I was l lucky to be able to leave that through other people without having to experience it myself. That was also something that I asked myself many times. Uh, uh, it was, why am I writing this? You know, I, I didn't have any family member with a very long illness. I mean, I did have my grandmother, but I, I, I hadn't been through an extreme experience or anything and often I asked, uh, but maybe am I the right person? I was in my 30s when I was uh, doing this 
And often also I thought, what are gonna like older people think about? Why am I right? I don't know if you asked that yourself, writing about death, I'm so young, and maybe I don't have the maturity to actually write about this. Um, but then I think it was also good that I had the distance. I mean, it was something that I was close to, but I wasn't living it myself. And so I was an observer, an observer of something that we never get to observe unless when we actually live it. So it was like a privilege. Uh, it really was. And then I have to say that it was funny, just before we came, we came to the event, Danielle said, oh, this is going to be a fun one. I said, oh, yes, sure, death and disease. I usually, it's been very mild because sometimes people cry in, <laughs> in my events, just like started crying. And, and I sometimes I cry too. I haven't cried in, in, cried in this one. Um, but you're saying, oh, it's fun, and uh, it's going to be a funny one, and th it's incredible, but the people that I have met who work in uh, end-of-life care are so funny and so happy and so joyful. Uh, and that was the, well, the experience I had with the doctors. It's like, you know, they, they constantly deal with that, and they are constantly thankful for, for, for their life and, and having fun, and I think it does make you have a bit more fun. Maybe not you, Paul, you have enough fun, but uh, <laughs> with that. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I think that we are out of time, but uh, for those of you who are present, uh, there are English and French editions of both books for sale upstairs. For those of you who are not present, uh, there are editions in your local independent bookstore, uh, and, and both of these works have been translated in languages other than just uh, French and English, so uh, I encourage you to go out and find them and, uh, and enjoy the rest of this afternoon. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Very much, Thank Daniel. you to the organizers as well. Thank you.